All right. Um, we might kick it off, everyone. Uh, we've got people in the room and online. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Dawson. I'm the branch head for community safety and really pleased to introduce today's speaker. Uh, before I do that, I just want to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Uh, it's really my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. John Snyder, here today. John is a senior advisor at, at the Global Earthquake Model, or GEM, Foundation in Italy, and really well placed to give us a, a view of what's happening um, in, in his world. The, for those of you who don't know, the Global Earthquake Model Foundation is a non-governmental organisation and it has public and private partnerships devoted to the assessment of earthquake risk worldwide. GA has been a long time supporter of, of GEM and a sponsor and a collaborator uh, from as early as 2010. And we utilise the GEM uh, tools, uh, including OpenQuake in Australia and in collaborations on the work that we do uh, both in Australia and regionally. And we contribute um, many of our hazard and risk information products to the global community through GEM. Uh, in this presentation, John will talk about the recent developments in GEM, uh, including the new second generation global earthquake hazard and risk maps, which were released uh, in late last year. Uh, he'll also discuss the strategic aims of GEM that are of particular interest to, to us in GA, and especially opportunities uh, in multi-hazard risk assessment for across uh, other hazards, including tsunami, uh, tropical cyclones and floods. Um, and in the assessment and delivery of earthquake uh, impact forecasting to the emergency management community, which we're very interested in. So John, uh, his background, he received a PhD in geophysics from the University of Wisconsin and subsequently held positions in academia, uh, private industry in the US. Uh, in 2000, John came to Canberra and worked, uh, worked here at GA and in fact uh, really um, you know, established a, a solid capability around urban risk assessments. Um, and in fact, we see um, shadows of John's work in, in the things that we do today. So thank you for that, John. Uh, John um, then went on and represented GA in Australia in the GEM governing board from 2010 and ultimately chairing the GEM board. Um, after John left GA, he uh, served as a secretary general of GEM Foundation in Italy um, up until last year. And now he continues a role as senior uh, advisor to GEM and we're really pleased to have you here, John. Um, well, welcome back to GA, it's great to see you again. Um, the floor is yours. Great. Okay, thank you very much, John. And um, it, it is indeed great to be back here. Um, I gave my first talk in this room, I think in, um, well, it would have been a, um, somewhere between 2000 and 2000. I think in 2000, this room wasn't actually here. The building was, but uh, anyway, it's been, it's, been, uh, it's been a long association I've had, and it's great to see a lot of people that, that um, I've worked with over the years and, are, uh, and, uh, and I'm still fortunate to be able to work with um, through the work that we're doing with uh, GEM Foundation. So let's see how this works. Okay. Um, today I'd like to give a little bit of an overview of GEM. Uh, John has already given a, a taste. Uh, I think most, of, well, many of you are actually quite familiar with the organization. Um, and uh, some of you, have, most of the rest probably have heard of GEM in some, in some context. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a uh, summary of some of our recent developments and and look at uh, future directions and collaboration opportunities that I, I think uh, we can follow up with. So uh, the foundation, nonprofit NGO, uh, as John said, um, the organization developed software, tools, and data for use in earthquake hazard and risk assessment worldwide and together with local governments and other institutions, uh, including the private sector, uh, we uh, facilitate and promote their use um, in, a, in, a, in a wide range of disaster risk reduction applications, including insurance, um, post-disaster response and recovery, uh, risk assessments, et cetera. 
So overall, our vision is for a world that's resilient to earthquakes and other natural hazards. Um, I thought I'd show this. This slide's not the greatest resolution, but it was taken right out front of the building here in, in March 2009. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in there someplace, uh, I think a couple of others of you as well, but it was the first, it was actually, that workshop was held the, the same month that GEM Foundation was, was formally established in Pavia, and we held this uh, so-called GEM One workshop uh, right here with uh, presentations in this room uh, in March of 2009. Um, <clears throat> 2010, then, we, we officially became sponsors, or that is we, I say we as in GA. Uh, <laughs> I may slip back and forth between my identity, uh, uh, between the two institutions. But uh, so Jem was a, uh, GA became a, a public governor at that time. In uh, 2018, the uh, uh, GA contributed then the national, its national earthquake hazard and risk models to the global maps. And these were uh, put together, um, I think especially the, uh, the, the hazard was, was built, the hazard model was built using the open quake tools. Um, and then I think in 2018 uh, started a um, uh, series of projects uh, led by Mark Edwards and the, um, the vulnerability and risk team here looking at infrastructure risk in WA. Uh, that's been a very good collaboration. And, and I think importantly in December of last year, GA uh, formally um, signed a new agreement to renew its sponsorship of GEM for another five years. <clears throat> and that extends then to the end of 2028. So that'll make uh, almost 20 years of, of um, collaboration by that point. So I think that's uh, fantastic. Now this, uh, <clears throat> I dug this slide up. Um, some of you may recall this. Um, this was actually, this slide I presented in that 2009 workshop uh, in this room. Um, it, it actually originated from the, what was then known as the Critical Infrastructure uh, program. And I think um, Greg Scott or, or one of his um, uh, staff prepared this, but it, it was to uh, illustrate, I think illustrates quite well, the problem. And the problem that we're still dealing with. I, I'm not sure I would redraw this any other way right now, but you know, starting with the occurrence of an event, the various data layers, um, geospatial layers, buildings, people, infrastructure, uh, the information on vulnerability, community profiles, and then being able to um, estimate impact. Um, and I think you know, we, we've been talking in the last couple of days about how to get at uh, infrastructure systems and, and network models and, um, and how to um, inform this important area of cost recovery or cost and, and then recovery from, from impacts. Um, and, and at this broader category of indirect losses. I think to this day, we're still focused primarily on getting uh, uh, the best estimate possible of impact from, you know, direct impact on the day uh, of a disaster. And that's, of course, crucially important, but um, really the next uh, phase of development and for JAM and I think also for GA is, is looking further downstream and trying really to inform um, risk assessment processes um, with much richer information to inform um, the broader impact and the, uh, the, the overall um, disaster recovery process. Oh yeah, we did a bit of macroeconomic stuff too. <laughs> um, the, uh, so GEM's, GEM's uh, collaboration framework, really it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we develop tools, we develop products, but, but it's all founded on the collaborations with uh, a wide range of institutions worldwide. Um, and what we really try to do is link these at very scale. So 
we're rolling up from local to country to regional to global level and then back down again. So really trying to get maximum utility out of and, and, and uh, use of common tools, but using local expertise to uh, drive the um, development of information and, and uh, knowledge. So we're guided by these principles, collaboration, credibility, openness, and public good. And I'd say these are really uh, founding principles and they stand to this day extremely importantly uh, to uh, everything that we do. Our sponsors and major contributors, and here you see this divided at the top between public um, it should say public and private governors. Sorry, it should be public on the left and then private on, on the right. So you have Geoscience Australia here, a number of, um, of um, geological surveys, but also um, in some cases um, emergency services uh, organizations uh, and, and, and others that, that uh, make up the public component of this. Um, the private side is made up um, largely of insurance companies, uh, major global reinsurers, as well as uh, insurance brokers. Um, and uh, this component probably drives um, about half the funding that, that GEM gets. Um, the rest is from the public side and from uh, projects. Um, public Sorry, this advisor category, these are also sponsors, but they're paying a little bit less so that they, they don't have the vote uh, on the board, but all the voting members are across the top. And then associates are international organizations, usually that are um, um, either, either institutions that um, are assisting with um, you know, professional development, publications, but also uh, the UN Disaster Risk Reduction uh, Branch of the UN, the USGS, are also a part of that. And then some other partners that um, work with us more on a project basis. So it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, um, comprehensive group of organizations. There are many others that we work with more informally. Um, through capacity building projects funded by USAID or projects with World Bank and so forth. So methodology, we, we collect and I think this is pretty much standard and, and in parallel to what, what GA does, collecting and processing uh, data worldwide. Um, we develop an, uh, an, an understanding of the earthquake hazard that is the potential for an earthquake and its um, uh, ground shaking um, as the primary estimate of the, of the hazard. So ground shaking hazard is, is the main driver of the work that, that we've been doing. Um, and then exposure, a global database of exposure about buildings and population, I'll talk a bit about that. And then uh, a very strong uh, uh, foundation in uh, vulnerability assessment, very engineering based in terms of understanding structural performance and, and uh, impacts on, on a wide range of buildings. But we also look at vulnerability of people in terms of uh, social factors and uh, try to understand um, the um, impact of events in terms of, for instance, displacement of populations and mortality. I'll talk a bit about that too. Open Quake Engine is, is really the you know, the tool set that drives a lot of the uh, uh, user's interest and, and the collaboration because it uh, also provides a platform for um, a common methodology, a common programming language, et cetera. It's regularly updated and we, we uh, take on input from our, our users and stakeholders to make that uh, as up-to-date as possible. It's free. And it's used widely, not only in the public sector, but it's used uh, in the insurance uh, and engineering sector uh, quite um, uh, comprehensively worldwide at this point. Uh, big effort we put into uh, training and capacity building, so working with uh, developing countries, but also with organizations that simply 
don't have the in-house uh, capability. Um, the the uh, OpenQuake tools, the databases, and so forth uh, can really accelerate the ability of organizations to uh, understand uh, hazard and risk in their context and also to um, eventually build their own models. Uh, so for instance, we, we've done projects with the with the Columbian Geological Survey where we helped them develop their own national earthquake hazard uh, model and map and we're now working with them on a, on a risk model. And there are other examples of that. So let me just flick now to recent developments. Um, and I'll focus mainly on the global, um, the global earthquake hazard and risk model and associated maps uh, because we just we first released the global uh, maps in 2018 um, with a huge, um, huge effort to pull all of that together. Uh, and then we, um, uh, essentially just as I was signing off as Secretary General, we released the second version. Um, and, um, and so that's, uh, that was uh, in October. Uh, so I'd like to just give a a brief uh, summary of some of the features. Now we call it a, uh, particularly in the hazard domain, we call this a global mosaic because it's a, it's, it's a global, some people have the impression that if you, you know, with, and with a lot of other products, you say you have a global map, it's often at, at, a, very, at a very low resolution. So it, yes, it has coverage, but it doesn't necessarily have the detail. So this is really a, a collection of maps at national to regional level, then um, homogenized and, and aggregated, integrated into a, into a, into a global uh, coverage. So it has 30 models from uh, various authors, including Geoscience Australia. Um, most of them have been implemented most of them have been natively built in OpenQuake. Some were then later translated in, from, from other codes, but the entire suite of models then is implemented in the map through OpenQuake, and they're all available to anybody who wants to. Well, I would say they're all available either openly or for public good application in a few cases where some of these models have commercial value, we do, we do try to get a little uh, additional support, particularly out of the private sector, to, to help um, sustainability of the organization. Um, so, um, but all the models are hosted, and, and, and GA as a sponsor has access to everything. Uh, okay, so then uh, now, between 2018 and, and 2023, then, this map illustrates the models that uh, were improved through uh, some through specific projects uh, that were funded by other organizations or were um, inspired by the interest of, of our sponsors. Uh, and some were simply up updated, like the USA and Canada models uh, were, were developed by those organizations and then contributed. So that's, um, and the Australia, the new model from GA is, I don't think, we don't, obviously we don't have the latest one. We have the one, we have the 2018 one still, is that right? Trevor's nodding, okay. So that will be updated when it's ready. Uh, and then, so here's the map. Um, now, you can see as you would, as you would expect um, that the hazard is dominated by the plate boundaries uh, throughout the world, and um, and but it's you know it's quite distributed ar around the world. It doesn't look too different from the map um, in 2018, but I'll I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, some of the differences in or improvements to the um, map come from improvements of of the uh, earthquake occurrence and and ground motion models that make up those, those, um, those maps. Um, there's a few technical details here, such as how we truncate ground motion distributions and, and we establish um, uh, 
uh, a, a uniform level for the minimum magnitude. Um, interestingly, I think to uh, the average user, the, the grid is a much higher density, so we have something like four times as many points in this map than in the previous map. And we've included more measures of intensity, uh, so essentially different measures of hazard uh, into that map. And then it's been disaggregated so you can see results for some key cities. So those are just a few highlights. But this is a difference map. So comparing the 10% in 50-year uh, peak ground acceleration map, so that's uh, essentially a 1 in 475-year reflection of the, of the ground-shaking hazard. Uh, and you can see some areas, for instance, around the Hindu Kush here where there's High, there's a, uh, a, a slight increase in the, no, that's a decrease in the hazard to 2023. 20, um, there's an interesting one here with PNG, and that reflects the fact that, that you guys, GA, generated a new um, hazard map for Papua New Guinea, and it has lower hazard than the previous one did. So um, anyway, there's all those sorts of uh, differences are reflected. Um, now, just now shifting to uh, the risk side of the, of, the, of the maps and models, the global exposure model uh, then underpins the assessment of, of risk. This particular map shows the economic value of residential, commercial, and industrial buildings worldwide using a hexagonal grid. And you can see, you know, as you would expect, high, you know, high value in in uh, in the U.S., uh, very high value in Europe, um, quite high value in 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 Asia here. But it's driven, perhaps, more by the sheer numbers of uh, of assets rather than uh, their um, economic value. So this is using the U.S. dollar as a as a common. Basis. So in this in this map, we're just looking at the numbers of buildings, and then you see a bit of differences. So now you see a much much higher um, um, value, say in in India and in China and so forth, and a little less so in the U.S. because it's just reflecting the uh, more the density of the uh, building stock. Um, again, importantly, it. From an exposure point of view, it's not just the global um, collection of information. It's actually it's act, it's actually a collection of detailed exposure information at the at the uh, in in most cases at the subnational level. So this this gives you a a picture of India and the, the um, you know in, e in each of those um, polygons is is essentially a um, an, an aggregation of information about the uh, buildings and, um, and and population statistics, and it's not just quantity of building; it's building types. It's it's uh, information that can be used to determine vulnerability and um, and risk. So we have in the in the exposure model we have numbers of buildings, we have replacement cost of buildings. And we have construction areas, examples of the metrics. And you can see that when you rank these by a country, that different India stands out for having the most buildings, the US having the highest replacement cost. This is independent of earthquakes. Now, this is just just their um, just just the value of the exposure. And in terms of construction area of buildings, it's China. So looking at, at, at um, vulnerability, we have here, um, in this case, I thought it was interesting to note that we've, we've added a few uh, structure types. So GEM has a, a, a building taxonomy that was developed in collaboration with World Bank. And that taxonomy, which basically uh, helps to, to then define um, structure types and, and, and uh, building usage types, Worldwide is is being used consistent cons consistently across the uh, the database. So, but we've added a few. 
you can see here, and associated vulnerability curves, which then relate the potential loss uh, of, that, of that building uh, or structure relative to a, 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 in this case, it's a, well, this is presenting a loss ratio. That's not so important. But it shows um, how this changes with the, um, the uh, spectral acceleration. And, and um, importantly, in the 2023 maps, we've, we've in, um, increased the uh, number of metrics of vulnerability or risk. So we have, we're computing numbers of buildings lost, uh, area of, of um, structures lost, so that includes all of the floors added together, um, economic loss, fatalities, and displaced persons. These are all these are all risk metrics included in the in the model now, um, and it's interesting. Of course, it's probably not a surprise to the engineers when you look at um, fatality rates. The concrete structures turn out to be uh, the uh, present the highest fatality rates. Masonry structures um, uh, next, and then the lowest fatality rates are the wood structures. So we have a here's the risk map when you pull all that together. This is in terms of average annual economic loss. So it's the, if you take all of the events, so we calculate a huge, we do a huge uh, sampling, stochastic sampling of all possible uh, earthquakes that, 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 that we think might happen over the next 100,000 years. And the idea is you then, you then average that and then on a per year basis, recognizing that earthquakes don't happen every year, but the average then per year is what we're presenting here. And uh, you see here average annual economic loss. And in the, uh, and, and notably in this case, the average annual loss, um, the total we estimate is about 84 billion US dollars. It's, I think it's at least 50% more than we estimated in 2018. Uh, but we've done quite a bit of calibration. Uh, we've done quite a bit of analysis of historic events. And we've, we've tried to uh, also then model those events under, under current conditions with current exposure to us re-estimate losses. And so this result, it reflects a, a, a complete validation of the model against uh, empirical uh, losses over the last uh, 50 years. Um, and then when you look at, so when you look at average annual loss, Japan, uh, because it has high economic value and very high hazard, uh, turns out, out to have the highest um, average annual loss, U.S. second, China next. But when you look at the loss ratio, that is the ratio of losses compared to the country's uh, GDP, so that is the proportion of loss for that economy, you see that the Sol Solomon Island is first. And so in that, by that measure, from a national, um, you know, from a national uh, government or, you know, a, um, from their national perspective, you, you would say they have the highest risk because they, they, they are potentially losing a much greater proportion of their, um, of their economic value to earthquakes than is uh, Japan. Afghanistan next, Vanuatu. So you see a number of countries here that are, um, you know, small, small countries, small island states, and so forth. And that's extremely important. Okay, then when we look at uh, number of buildings destroyed, so this is then takes the, the uh, essentially takes the economic valuation out of it. So we're just looking at proportion of numbers or proportions of buildings. Uh, or the, the uh, looking at the, the building stock more directly. And now we've got an average annual building lost 379,000 buildings on average every year. Well, uh, in an average year. And India, not surprisingly, comes out first. Pakistan, Philippines next. And China, and when you look at um, um, and then when you look at the area of the building stock rather than numbers of buildings, China is first. 
Okay, and then so if we look at these various risk metrics and we look at compare buildings lost, area lost, that is area of buildings, economic loss measured in US dollars, fatalities and displaced persons, um, then you, uh, you see different uh, rankings of these uh, uh, countries uh, depending on the metric that, uh, that you see there. So I think each, each of these has its merits, each of them has its, its use. Uh, the economic stuff's of more interest to the insurance industry. Fatalities and, and displaced persons is much more of interest to emergency management organizations um, and so forth. And uh, I think importantly then for each country, we have a, what we call a country or territory seismic risk profile. So this, on the order of 190 countries, we have one of these maps for every one of those. And in some cases, they're disaggregated down to a provincial level. Uh, it's quite detailed, but what you see here are losses. You have information on building types. You have information on what the most vulnerable building types are. And you have sort of provincial or territorial level information on where the, the highest risk is. All of, all of this stuff is available online through the website. So you can go download your global hazard map and you can pick whatever flavor map you like. Um, there's um, half a dozen different metrics there. The engine itself, if you want to get stuck into modeling, that's there or just talk to one of the hazard guys or risk guys here. Um, the global risk map, the exposure model, it's available at the admin one level. So the first uh, level below country level is available free to anyone who wants it. Um, that tells you everything about the building types and the population. The vulnerability model, there's, there are on the order of a thousand vulnerability curves. So if you want to model buildings or you want to do sensitivity analyses, all of those curves are, are available. And these risk profiles at country level are all there. And the website is the glo at globalquakemodel.org slash product. Okay, now I'm going to, yeah, good. Okay, I'm going to switch to new directions. Um, a couple years ago, I guess it was, yeah, a couple years ago, we completed a strategic plan and roadmap to 2030. And um, the idea was to try to try to put some some. Uh, you know, uh, identify some prior priorities for development as well as some identify areas where we could collaborate with others and so forth. So in this, um, in this uh, sort of roadmap, we have uh, at 2022, I guess when this was first released, I'd say certainly our focus was primarily on direct impacts of earthquakes and, and more on the, on, the, um, on the physical impact we're moving into uh, spending more time and energy into the uh, secondary or triggered hazards from earthquakes, so tsunami, landslide, uh, earthquake-induced landslide, uh, liquefaction. Uh, Multi-hazard and systemic risk is, is uh, an area of increasing interest and development. And then this sort of, you might say, uh, ultimate goal is to have much more integrated risk and resilience modeling. So we're looking much more, uh, say, at the urban scale. We're integrating with other, um, you know, we say climate change adaptation and the earthquake work and the, the, the broader community uh, risk is, is, um, is put together into a way that actually provides a much more holistic understanding of risk. So this is kind of the way the thinking goes in terms of how we, how we move forward. So we divided this into, into three kind of streams, earthquake and secondary hazards. Uh, and, you, and you can see a few things there um, of interest, uh, including future exposure. How do, we, how do we understand, particularly for, uh, not only for earthquake, but for say climate adaptation um, risk assessment, what's the population or the building distribution uh, or, or value or what have you, what's it gonna look like in 2050? 
should, what sort of infrastructure changes should we be doing now to adapt for climate change that we know is coming? And how can we do it most cost effectively? This is the sort of stuff that, you know, the, the exposure database and a better understanding of, of buildings and population can really inform that kind of analysis. Um, let's see, so a couple of, so multi-hazard risk. Now GA is, has been long been doing work on, on, um, on tsunami, on uh, bushfire risk, on, on severe wind. These are areas uh, where, you know, there's ripe opportunity for, for collaboration. Um, and uh, let's see, risk uh, resilience. You know, if better informing policy, going into predicting recovery, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about <coughs> this issue of, you know, how we use these models to, to um, improve our understanding of disaster impact. So we're already getting into that recovery space. Okay, keep moving. Um, in 2023, in fact, uh, yesterday marked the one year anniversary of the uh, earthquake, the first earthquake in Turkey, and, um, and today the second, the second, the two uh, major earthquakes that struck in Turkey. Um, and not surprisingly, that sparked a lot of interest in how we better understand the uh, impact of these events. There was another one in September in Morocco, um, and another one significantly in, um, in Afghanistan. And we were invited then by the European Union to um, help inform their emergency management response processes. Um, and, uh, and we produced than uh, estimates of damage for those those events, but it was done very much on a, I would say, an ad hoc basis. We had the data, we had some data, we had the models, and we had, as we discovered, we had much more in many cases than anybody else did. So um, it seemed logical to provide it, but we didn't want to release it to the public because we really hadn't calibrated these. Uh, these models or develop an operational capability. But we, at the same time, we've, we're now associated with a program called Aristotle, which has a very bizarre acronym for All Risk Integrated System for Transboundary Holistic Early Warning. God knows. Whatever that means, it means it's a, it's a multi-hazard um, uh, early warning and, and alert system that Europe, Europe is putting together um, started with earthquake, but they're, you know, they're, they're incorporating flood, bushfire, uh, a range of other hazards. We are now uh, part of that system and are providing uh, impact assessments using OpenQuake and we'll be leveraging our exposure database also for other hazards to improve their estimates of impact. But um, so this is, um, yeah, okay, so the idea, and we're just putting together a, a process, a, a protocol for this. GEM's main role is then as a key information provider um, so that other users can refer to our stuff. We're not going to be a frontline, um, you know, warning system operator. Um, we won't be 24 seven, uh, but we, we will on a nominally sort of within uh, 24 to 72 hours, we will provide best estimates, best effort to emergency management organizations or, or anyone who, um, with whom we essentially have a trusted agreement with. It won't be simply put out uh, on demand. But I, but I think this is also an opportunity for us to, to collaborate or at least coordinate activities uh, and perhaps information with Geoscience Australia, for instance. Because the Europeans aren't just interested in assets in Europe, they're, in they're interested in, in impacts globally that have imp implications for Europe. And similarly, GA has information that is global. So we can, we can leverage this and be, um, 
and, and collaborate uh, with others. So that's, that's a, an area for us to explore. Um, so the timeline here, the idea is you'd have a, you'd tie the earthquake alert to uh, the USGS pager alert. So if the, uh, if it comes up as a, what they call a red alert, in other words, it's a confirmed event, then we, we would take it seriously and we'd start uh, doing additional analyses. So it would really be adding, uh, it'd be value adding information that USGS is doing, uh, leveraging their, their global capability for alerts. And, and of course, we're also developing a, a collaboration with the USGS so that we can um, do this uh, seamlessly. Anyway, then it triggers a, an event response, some analysis, and then there would be various stages of first delivering estimates and then engaging and improving depending on the, um, on the event. Okay, and then uh, uh, shifting, I just wanted to say a few words about global tsunami model. Um, I was here at GA when we developed the first uh, national uh, tsunami, the, I think the, the world's first national tsunami hazard map. Yeah, I think it was between us, between GA and New, New Zealand who was actually first, but in any case, uh, that was triggered of course by the 2004 tsunami an earthquake in Indonesia. Um, and uh, nobody had any clue as to what the um, tsunami hazard was in the Indian, Indian Ocean at that time. So there was a big effort put forward. GA was very much involved. In um, June of last year, uh, uh, Stefano Lorito from uh, INGV in Italy presented to a GEM conference uh, his ideas on, on uh, collaboration in this space. There is a anomaly, a, glo uh, a global tsunami model network. It's dominated right now by the Europeans. Um, uh, and here's here are a number of organizations that have kind of signed up that are interested. So I would call this an interest group, kind of a, a, a loose framework collabor collaborative network, but it's it's lacking glue, it doesn't, it doesn't, and it's lacking funding at this point. Um, but there's, you can see there's wide interest. And in Stefano's uh, presentation, he cited uh, Gareth Davies and all publication on the, the, uh, uh, the first global tsunami hazard map. So GA was front and center in developing this, this, uh, this first model and in, and in uh, it, it, it came out of work that, that we had been doing before with the global assessment report that the UN put together. And um, so I don't think things have actually advanced that far since then. This was published in 2018. Um, GA is not on that list of collaborators of the GTM, but I think um, you, know, you might want to think about it. Um, and we, so we've thought about how we, um, a little bit how GEM and GTM could work together. So having, of course, a common modeling of global earthquake occurrence would be a good start, recognizing that at least 80% of the tsunami hazard comes from earthquakes. Um, sharing, sharing our data products, um, uh, informing the, the uh, impacts with the global exposure modeling, uh, et cetera. And then uh, potentially using the open quake engine as the risk uh, engine for, um, you know, once you've input the, the, the hazard through uh, uh, what we call hazard footprints of all the events that could, could occur, you can then use uh, open quake as the uh, tool for assessing risk or computing impact. Um, so anyway, there's some thoughts for how uh, that might progress and I'd like to explore that further with you. I'll just throw out a couple of other quick things. Um, just food for thought, but future exposure for multi-hazard risk assessment. On, on the right of the screen, you see um, uh, a time lapse thing that goes uh, from 1975 to 2050, I think. Uh, just looking at France and the uh, 
um, evolution of infrastructure, buildings and infrastructure over that period. But it, it's, it's not just a blind um, model. It actually takes into, into account planning that we're aware of. It takes into account road density. It takes into account ge uh, ge geographic features like slope and elevation and rivers and so forth. So it's, it's an, it's an in, I like to think it's a reasonably intelligent projection of population. And uh, so we, at this point, we've done that for Europe. And I think you know, there's interest um, generally in, in having this sort of capability uh, much more widely global. So that's an area we're, we're, uh, we're working on. Um, and maybe GA would be interested in doing that too. Um, and uh, another one that's a bit maybe not something one would think is obvious, but um, we've looked at, um, for instance, the uh, carbon footprint of buildings. And again, once you know something about buildings and you know something about how they're made, you can start to understand uh, uh, you know, how much carbon's embodied in them, how much carbon is lost in building them, how much energy those buildings consume uh, through heating and air conditioning. And you can then take another step and say, well, we could, through various policy implements, we could uh, intelligently project cost benefits of doing things now that would affect future uh, energy consumption and carbon um, and the carbon footprint of our built infrastructure. So I think you know, these are important directions. JAM is not trying to do all of this by itself. I'm, I'm putting this out there as these are ways to leverage stuff that we've done, ways to collaborate with other organizations, and ways to you know, bring um, you know, greater awareness uh, overall to uh, hazards and risks. So I'm gonna, I think my last slide is uh, this. So, so collaboration opportunities, um, just to quickly summarize, uh, post-disaster earthquake impact analysis, uh, the tsunami hazard and risk assessment, which I um, mentioned, infrastructure uh, system risk, which uh, we're currently doing with, with GA through the Ramsey project. But that could also, there are a number of GEM collaborators that are interested in doing similar work. So we could, um, we could extend this to, a, to a, um, a subgroup of GEM supporters that is interested in, in doing similar things. Uh, and then, um, of course, the uh, revised Australian hazard model, uh, we'll incorporate that into the map when Trevor's ready. And uh, I me I'll mention this USAID uh, project force. I don't have time to talk much about it, but it's part of that project is looking to improve earthquake risk assessment for island states. So we focus a lot on continents and large land masses, but the islands have kind of been not left out, but there hasn't been a specific study devoted to those. And um, we're having a, a workshop in Suva, uh, Fiji, and I don't know the exact date, but uh, my understanding from Catalina uh, uh, Yepes, who leads that, is she'd love to have GA people there. So more on that. Uh, cyclone, tropical cyclone, wind and storm surge. Again, GA's done huge work in this area. Uh, you know, there's, I think, long term, an opportunity to perhaps integrate that into a common risk uh, computational um, program. Talked a little bit yesterday uh, uh, with Jono about time-dependent source modeling. Um, you know that is looking at how the you know the probability of earthquakes changes with the earthquake cycle. So it's not just a random Poissonian process. Lots of interest from reinsurers on this because it really affects the very very uh, dramatically the price of uh, of reinsurance for for earthquake. And we're talking billions of dollars per year being spent. Um, and then uh, future exposure modeling, climate change risk, you know, these are areas that, that could be explored. So I uh, thank you very much. I think it's time for me to stop and maybe we have time for a few questions. Thanks.